electronegativity is, again, it's the degree to which electrons in a chemical bond are attracted to an element. Now, who's going to have the greatest attraction on the periodic table? It's fluorine. And fluorine is given an electronegativity of 4.0. It's actually a calculated number. 4.0 electronegativity. I'm fluorine. I want electrons the most. And nothing beats fluorine. <laughs> so here's the thing. Everything then is kind of compared now to fluorine. And look at hydrogen with an electronegativity of 2.2. So the electrons in this bond, we draw bonds like that, that, that are two electrons being shared between uh, atoms as a line. Those two electrons are drawn more to the fluorine than to the hydrogen because hot fluorine has a greater electronegativity. Where do you get these numbers from? Any periodic table worth its salt is going to have, oh, that's a good chemistry pun, is going to actually have electronegativities listed for you so you can actually check them. Now, 4.0 to 2.2. There's an electronegativity difference. That means that there's a partially negative end here and a partially positive end here. We draw an arrow from the one that is losing the electrons in the bond to one that is gaining the electrons in the bond. Put a little cross there. It means that's the positive end and that's the negative end. So you don't actually have to write these partialities there. And that's a molecule that's polar. Okay, so there's an electronegativity difference, and, and the difference there about 1.8, right? After you get to about 1.8 and greater, the exchange of electron here is more like not even sharing anymore. Fluorine and hydrogen are pretty much at the boundary between something that's covalent and ionic. Now look, here's a covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen. The electronegativity difference there of about, what is that, 1.3? means then that that is still going to be in the range of sharing electrons. And that's what happens in an O to H bond. Now, by the way, oxygen and hydrogen don't like to necessarily bond like that. They'd rather bond like this and make a water molecule, right? And each of these bonds would be polar in nature. And by the way, because water is a bent shape, it is overall a polar molecule. And what does it mean then if it wasn't in a bent shape? Then it would be nonpolar. Nothing could dissolve in it that does today and that would just change everything okay now here's the thing NaCl though you look at that difference and that difference in electronegativity is huge it's about what is that that's about, about 2.3 uh, right it, it, as a difference and when you get past again that about 1.8 or so 1.9 that bond right there is more like the chlorine saying look you got no power over me NaCl in terms of attraction of those electrons in the bond so I'm just taking them and that's a transfer of electrons, and that designates an ionic bond. So because of that huge electronegativity difference, that bond is more like a transfer again, and we call it ionic as opposed to being covalent. But it's still highly polar. I mean, it's not partially positive and negative. It's totally positive and totally negative, man. And so that is, we, don't, we call it ionic, but it's very polar, right? All of these substances here, if you mix them together in solution, are going to be able to mix together and form some kind of a heterogeneous grouping in solution. That's because they're all polar. But then, if you threw in something like, oh, okay, well, H2 or F2, well, guess what? Those molecules are nonpolar, right? Because there's no electronegativity difference here. And you know what that means? That these guys can't dissolve very well into these over here. That's pretty cool. We talked about that in the solutions unit. Like dissolves like. Polars dissolve in polars and nonpolars only with each other. Cool.